Hello viewers, today I will transport you to a domestic setting amidst the backdrop of a buzzing Christmas Eve, bringing forth a very unpredictable theme of realization and separation. More importantly, the theme of a woman discovering herself. Viewers, even those who have not read Doll's House know Nora not for what she was, but what she becomes. So, without any delay, let me take you straight to this revolutionary play, A Doll's House by Henrik Ibsen. Henrik Johann Ibsen was born on March 20, 1828 in a small shipping town, Skyen in Norway. He was the eldest of his four brothers and sisters. Nud Ibsen, Henrik's father, was a well-to-do businessman. Unfortunately, he became bankrupt when Ibsen was only eight years old. The family was forced to move away to a farm and Ibsen realized the thanklessness of relatives young in life. Ibsen attended a private school at 16. He moved to Grimstad, a coastal town, to serve as an apprentice to apothecary, which brought him nothing but wretchedness. Ibsen wrote his first play, Catalina, in 1849. Although the play did not garner success, yet it proved to be significant historically. One after another, his plays opened to eager crowds and Ibsen became a full-fledged playwright. On personal front, his finances were shaky and he suffered commercial flip-flops. After the realistic drama Love's Comedy, Ibsen found himself excommunicated from his country, which marked a new era, brought him fame and success. He wrote most of his plays and his life was smooth after that. He began writing one play every year. Some of his famous plays, Catalina, The Warrior's Barrow, St. John's Eve, The Vikings of Helglind, Love's Comedy, The Pretenders, Brand, Piergint, League of Youth, Emperor and Galilean, Pillars of Society, A Doll's House, Ghosts, Enemy of the People, The Wild Duck, Hedda Gabler, The Master Builder, Little Elf and When the Dead Awaken. In 1900s, his health gave away. He suffered a paralytic attack and he never recovered. After five years of physical ill health, he died on 23rd May 1906. As the German critic Alfred Kurz ironically observed, the ruling men in Norway had a daemon among them and they buried a grande. Doll's House is a social realistic drama, a feminist play written by a male playwright, Ibsen who very carefully questions the position of a woman in her own house. As a dutiful husband, Torvald is a good provider. At the same time, he does not rise above his position, role or self to even momentarily protect his wife. This is a reality check for Nora, who decides that she has invested enough in Helmer and wants to move on to discover her potential and a sense of direction. A Doll's House is a divorce play and Henrik Ibsen's plays, as critic Barker suggests, may be called a drama of being rather than doing. Ibsen's plays resemble the Greek drama more than Shakespeare of well-made plays. Like the Greek plays, Ibsen uses the retrospective method by which a situation is developed rather than the story told. His plays open just before the catastrophe and the preceding events are recalled rather than represented on the stage. His skill lies in manipulating the threads of plot that each revelation of the past is linked to some turn 
in the revelation of character which forwards the immediate action of the play. To quote Barker again, like Greek dramatists, observance of the unities and fate motive is central to Ibsen. He reduces characters to bare minimum, which Barker endorses as simplifying the scheme of plays visible action. Moreover, the strength of Ibsen's plays lies in choosing familiar subject closer to the audience's life. Nora is a complex character. Ibsen took 10 years to sketch it, though some trace this idea to League of Youth where Selma's outburst is similar to the theme of Doll's House. It is but obvious that the doll in question is Nora and very interestingly it takes a man to make Nora realize that she is the doll. Eventually to express a similar idea let me quote Gassner who says the woman in doll's house was not intrinsically a doll barring the initial forgery she only pretended to be one because this was expected of her. Nora enters the scene tipping off the porter to find Helmer accusing her of inheriting her father's extravagance. He also discovers that Nora has been eating macaroons on the sly, a habit Helmer does not like at all. We tend to know more about Nora after Mrs. Lindy's arrival. Nora responds to Mrs. Lindy very sympathetically and later tells her that eight years of married life has been happy but not without hassles. Nora takes pride in the fact that she is able to raise money for her husband's trip to good health without any problem. In fact, she tells Mrs. Lindy that raising money and saving money of domestic expenses makes her feel like a man. It is this curious combination of childlike behavior and mature control that baffles people into disbelief momentarily. And we know for sure that Nora is keeping up appearances. Dr. Ranks presents and his subsequent proposal professing his love leads us to wonder whether Nora is really into him. But we know for a fact that all her life she has been extremely faithful to Helmer. Nora dispels the myth to assert her allegiance and love for Helmer as her cherished ideal. Later in the play we find it is this idea of selflessness that Nora expects in return. She is under the illusion that the selflessness which she exhibited in time of crisis will be the anchor of her relationship. Unfortunately, Helma burst the bubble and the truth is out to which Nora responds vocally by saying that he has no right to talk to her and believes that future is hers and she will take it in her stride. Walking out, she slams the door behind her and on everything that does not belong to her. Toward Helmer Toward Helmer is Nora's husband, who treats Nora as a child, frequently addressing her as sparrow and featherbrain, although his true colors of self-conceit and selfishness are exposed. When he rebukes Nora for the forgery which was done with an intention to save him. Also, Helmer's exclamation, which translates to, thank God I am saved, reveals him totally and actually makes him the villain of the piece. Mrs. Lindy is Nora's friend, who has fallen on bad time. She wants Nora's help to help secure a job at Helmer's bank. However, she ends up helping Nora from Krogstad's evil designs. She implores Krogstad 
to maintain calm and not destroy Nora's life. Krogstag relents to Mrs. Linde's advice. Eventually, Mrs. Linde is able to avert further aggravation of the domestic crisis. Krogstag is subordinate to Helmer and is supposed to bear a corrupt, immoral disposition. A widower, Krogstag takes care of his many children. Having lost the position at the bank once earlier, Krogstag decides to blackmail Nora to keep his job intact. However, because of Mrs. Linde's timely intervention, he has a change of heart and redeems Nora by depositing the bond in Torvald's letter box. In this process, he is able to find his love back, who is Mrs. Linde, and his life is happy again. Dr. Rank is the Helmer's family friend, a doctor by profession. He visits the couple very often. We are later given to understand that he is secretly in love with Nora, professes it to her, and eventually dies a very lonely death. The scene opens in the Helmer's house. It is Christmas evening and Nora pays the porter to enter into the house. She brings in the Christmas tree along with her and is glad to see her three adorable kids. Nora is married for eight years now and enjoys the attention she gets from her husband toward Helmer. Helmer thinks that Nora has made huge purchases and has duly inherited her father's spendthrift nature. He also reprimands Nora for eating macarons, which he thinks are not good for her. Two visitors' arrival is introduced simultaneously. Dr. Rank, the family friend, and a lady's presence is announced. The stranger is none other than Nora's friend, Christine Linde who has lost her husband three years ago. Nora is glad to see Mrs. Linde and apologizes for not staying in touch during hard time. Nora tells Christine of her own travails. The friends catch up with each other's personal life subsequently. Mrs. Linde is now anxious for a job and she is childless and also a widow. She expects Helmer to help her secure a job. Nora, on the other hand, very proudly declares that she has been through tough times too and that she has literally saved Torvald's life by raising 250 pounds. As this was the amount which was required to take him to a long trip to recover from his ill health. Nora also discloses that despite being called a spendthrift, she has always saved money and saving money of domestic expenses made her feel so much like a man. She also fantasizes aloud that she secretly expects a rich old man to leave her a lot of money as inheritance. It is at this juncture that we are first introduced to Krogstad. Linde and Nora talk about Krogstad and Linde tells her brief association with Krogstad. As the solicitor's clerk, a little is known about Krogstad. He is presented as an offender, an immoral character who resorts to dubious ways and means. Dr. Rank, Mrs. Linde and Helmer make an exit. When Krogstad meets Nora, he threatens to disclose her act of forgery. Nora tells him that she did that to save the life of her husband and Krogstag wants to implicate her and damage her personal life. To save herself, Nora must influence Helmer to retain him as the subordinate at the bank. Nora's act of forgery involves signing the bond against her father's name. After Krogstag's exit, 
Nora brushes evil thoughts of the conversation away and concentrates on the children and wants to focus her attention on the fancy ball at the Strenbergs. Nora reverts to discuss Krogstad's issue with the husband, wherein she realizes that Krogstad is guilty of forgery and Helmer has extremely poor opinion of an act of this magnitude. Nora then expresses her fears of possible threat and bad press from Krogstad. Helmer terms them as fears she has inherited from her father, who once upon a time held a public position. Act 2 brings forth a development in the play. Nora, this point of time, is busy planning for the impending ball. She is designing clothes and is ready with rehearsals. Mrs. Lindy's arrival is welcome as Nora needs her help. Mrs. Lindy takes the liberty of asking Nora to define her relationships with Dr. Rank, who seems to be looming in the background. Mrs. Lindy indirectly alleges that probably Nora is leading the gentleman to believe in a possible rough relationship. Nora resolves to clear the air. Talks with Torvald fail utterly as Nora realizes that Helmer has dispatched the dismissal letter to Krogstad. It is at this anxious hour that Dr. Rank heads to meet Nora and professes his love for her, to which a no is an answer. Krogstad arrives at the Helmers and insists to meet Nora and threatens to leave a letter for Torvald in the letterbox exposing Nora's act of forgery. Nora is agitated and at this critical juncture she discloses the big secret to Linde, who in turn rushes out of the scene behind Krogstad to help settle the matter. Anxious Nora is not just scared but she is gripped with panic and pleads Helmer to stay by her side as they rehearse for the ball. Helmer is gripped with a sense of amusement that Nora has been not just excited but extremely passionate about the performance. The last and the final act begins with Krogstad coming over to talk to Mrs. Linde and the bringabouts of the conversation reveal that the duo a little more than acquaintances. They are ex-lovers. Mrs. Linde marries elsewhere due to domestic restraints. She asks Krogstad to give up the vicious dance and help save Nora. Krogstad has a change of heart. Interestingly, Mrs. Linde decides it is ideal for Helmer to know the truth as it will help resolve a crisis. Mrs. Linde now breathes a sigh of relief when she also understands that she can actually have the company of Krogstad in her lonely life. The Helmers walk in after Krogstad's exit, much against Nora's will. Torvald admires Nora and takes pride in the fact that she is the cynosure of all eyes at the ball. It is time for Dr. Rank to bid adieu. As already announced, Dr. Rank suffers from tuberculosis and a weak spine. So this is his goodbye to his friends, which is communicated through a card in the letterbox marked with a black cross. This comes across as another blow to Nora as the couple, importantly the Helmers, retire for the day, Helmer whispers sweet nothings to Nora and promises that ever if she were in danger, he would rescue her and save her life. A little later, Dr. Rank's black cross cards arrive. This is the beginning of the climax and Helmer screams in rage and expresses 
disbelief and shock and reprimands Nora in many words. Nora's reaction to the verbal spat is argumentative. Meanwhile, communication arrives for Nora, which Helmer insists on reading. The fatal bond has been delivered and Nora has been cleared of charges by Krogstad, to which Helmer reacts in excitement, saying, I am saved. This is the proverbial last straw that kills the camel. Nora has a conversation with Helmer and decides to leave him for good as she fails to understand that he did not protect her or secure her. She is assured that the maids have been trained to handle the house, hence leaves the household with the sound of the door shutting behind her. Literally, the past is behind her and Helmer is crying, Nora, Nora. The many themes in Doll's house are not just region specific, but hold true across cultures, regions and religions. This partly is a reason for the play's success. The theme of women's liberation. Ibsen in his time questioned different roles and roles for men and women. He exposes this inequality thoroughly. At the same time, Ibsen fought tooth and nail for women franchise and voting power. Through Nora, Ibsen points out at the fault lines in man-woman relationship. He tries to show how society has reduced home to a space of restriction and confinement where women are forced to play to their specific roles. Nora, despite her intelligence, appeal and character, is the skylark, the sparrow, called spendthrift, expected to dress and please the husband day in and out. The only time she gets to be inventive is during purchases and crisis and also sacrifice as and when required. Liberation from this bondage of domesticity which follows fake moral dicta is severely critiqued in this play. Despite being the perfect doll, Nora's life is incomplete and she realizes that bondage and sacrifice is not worth the salt. The theme of inequality in marriage. Marriage is a social institution which brings two consenting adults together, sanctioned by society, powered by conditioning of women. Traditionally, this institution has been totally ransacked by men who use it to their advantage. Helmer totally domesticates his wife, treats her like a child, makes fixed promises and during crisis thinks of no one else but himself, not even the wife who suffered with him in sickness and health. The play exposes this inequality in the relationship of man and woman. Theme of morality. In an interesting state of affairs, we see Nora forging a document, Helmer faking his affection, Dr. Rank calling Krogstad immoral, Krogstad threatening to blackmail Nora. We are left wondering as to why there is so much ado about everyone expecting morality without even being moral. This fundamental flaw in modern society and individuals who seek morality without applying it to themselves is revealed in many shades and ways. Theme of conforming to societal norms. Marriage as a norm has been explored as a refrain in Doll's House, but on thorough scrutiny, we find all characters living up to societal appearances. Nora picks up cheap stuff, turns it to look expensive. Krog tagged, faces fire from Mrs. Linde because he is penniless and cannot take care of Mrs. Linde's brothers and mother. Krog tagged, must keep the subordinate's position at the bank 
because his grown-up children must find suitable jobs. Meanwhile, the societal equations force Mrs. Linde, who is already overworked, to find a job, a problem compounded by the fact that Mrs. Linde is childless. All the characters, including Helmer, are in one way or the other victims of societal pressure and confirmation. Keeping up with appearances is but one of their many obligations. Well, friends, A Doll's House is a provocative play. I'm sure you enjoyed watching the program as much as I enjoyed presenting it to you. Thank you for being with me. Happy learning.